Excellent. Right, can I start by offering you a very warm welcome to this masterclass in planting for bees. Um, we're going to learn all about how to help our pollinators tonight to give you tips right from what you can plant on your, if you've just got a windowsill and a few pots, all the way to if you've got acres of uh, land. So we're hoping to give you inspiration and ideas of how we can really help our pollinators this year, enjoy them visiting our garden, what we can do to help them. And uh, Nigel will be telling us exactly how we can do that. So a brief introduction to me. My name is Catherine Clark. I'm a beekeeper and um, also the founder of Honey Bee Beautiful, a natural honey-based skincare business. And I'll be hosting tonight. And I'm very all the places that you're, you're from and it's it's amazing that so all over the country we can we can speak to people um as catherine said i'm fundraising manager for the uh, bumblebee conservation trust uh, i've been there almost five years five years ago ago i knew nothing about bumblebees i know a lot more now um prior to that i was very much in the environmental conservation sector um, and about five years ago i took voluntary redundancy took a year out and started like Catherine, um, I got interested in honeybees. Um, so yes, I am a beekeeper as well. So I have that sort of balance of beekeeping, a bit of knowledge about bumblebees and a bit of knowledge about plants and, and, and gardening. So, so that's where sort of I'm coming from. So uh, I'm sure there's gonna be plenty of questions tonight. So I think you've got a few already lined up for me, uh, Catherine. That's right, yes. Okay, well, let's start off with what we've already, we've sort of tried to work through the most commonly asked questions, haven't we, Nigel, to see if we can really answer, um, you know, some are, you know, starting from the beginning. So this is catering for all of you listeners, if you know nothing about bees, to hopefully people who know quite a bit and they um, uh, are into their gardening. So we try to cover most of what we think people will be interested in. So the first one, which we get asked the most, most commonly, or perhaps people make the most mistakes with is what can you tell us is the difference between bumblebees and honeybees? Uh, very good question and um, an interesting statistic that um, we've recently uh, come across with some of our research as an organization is that about 54 percent of the population in this country do not know the difference between honeybees and bumblebees. They think they're the same insect and quite clearly they're not. So hopefully I'll just give you some, a few pointers about the difference. I'm sure many of you will know the difference. Um, maybe 50% will know the difference. Um, but to start off with, bumblebees are wild. Honeybees are what I would term domesticated. They live in hives. So bumblebees live in nests underground, honeybees in hives. We have 24 species of bumblebee and just the one species of honeybee in this country. Nest sizes between the two, um, as you'll appreciate, hives can vary in size, but often they can get end up with 100,000, 120,000 uh, worker bees in there, whereas uh, a bumblebee nest will have up to 400, maybe 50 to 400 uh, worker bees. Um, another thing that people often hear about is that um, bees do, honeybees do this waggle dance, that, that they communicate with other honeybees in the hive. Bumblebees don't dance, but they do have smelly feet, and I may come on to that at a later date. Um, honeybees, the whole colony survives the winter. As long as the conditions are right, there will be a colony throughout the year, and it will carry on throughout a year on year. Whereas a bumblebee uh, colony, they will all die off, and they'll be left with one mated queen that uh, goes into hibernation. And the other key factor about honeybees and bumblebees is the difference of what they're, they're facing in terms of what they're struggling with. And for bumblebees, it's lack of habitat, lack of flowers. Um, and for hives, it's often related to disease that's been brought about by, by man and the way we manage uh, honeybees. So those are the sort of fundamental differences between uh, honeybees and bumblebees. Thanks, Nigel. And it, the look of them is quite different if you put them side by side, isn't it? You know, for... Uh, for people like us who are used to looking at honeybees a lot, being beekeepers, um, it's obvious. But if you actually put them side by side, the size, the sort of depth of their um, hairs on their body um, is quite distinctive, the differences. It, it, very much so. And I think it's, um, you know, one of the key things that I always look at is that, or I tell people, is that bumblebees have fluffy coats. Um, so they're the big, fat, furry things buzzing around on their own in the gardens with stripes on. 
They are um, cute. <laughs> very, very much so, yes. Um, and so talking about bumblebees, as that's your sort of area of expertise, um, how, can you tell us how many species of bumblebees there are in the UK? And for example, which are the most rare, which are we more likely to see in our gardens and which we're okay. unlikely yep. to see? Um, five years ago, as I said earlier, uh, I knew very little and I thought there was just one bumblebee, but actually there are 24 species. Um, we've lost three in this country um, to extinction already. Um, and of those 24 species that we st uh, still have, um, 18 are what I would term social, that, that they have an, a nest and um, they have workers and they have males inside. And six of them are cuckoo bumblebees. And cuckoo bumblebees are just like the bird. They, they, they identify a host nest, go in, kill the queen and lay, it, lay their own eggs. So we have six of those um, in this country. Of the 24, eight are very common and we call them the big eight at the end of the day. And those are the ones that most people are likely to see in their gardens out and about. And they're generally black with yellow and a white tail. So they may be the white tailed or the buff tailed bumblebee. Um, another common one is uh, a bumblebee that is generally all black with a red tail and it's known as the red tailed bumblebee. So there's eight of those. Um, in terms of rare bumblebees, um, we're hovering around eight that are what we would term rare or endangered. Um, and of two of those, um, are, they are extremely rare. One is in Scotland, uh, which is known as the great yellow bumblebee, now only found in the sort of uh, outer Hebrides, the north coast of Scotland and the Orkneys. 40, 50, 60 years ago, that used to be widespread and common across the country. So there's been a real change and transformation for that species. Uh, the other one is the shrill carder bee, um, and I noticed some of you are from Wales. Um, that bee is now, there's only now five populations in England, Wales. Three of those are found in, 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 in Wales, um, Pembrokeshire, uh, Port Talbot, Neath area, uh, and the Gwent Levels, and in England, Somerset and the Thames Gateway. Um, those populations are declining still, so that we've got an awful lot of work to try and protect and um, improve the habitat for those bumblebee species. And it is in essence about making sure that we manage our land correctly um, and provide the suitable habitat and plants for them to thrive. Yeah, and you'll be telling us later, Nigel, how people can get more involved with identifying yes. bumblebees and helping yes, with surveying. So it's just really exciting to become a bee uh, bumblebee walker. Um, so you'll tell us all about that in a bit. But if you had to sum up, what would be your top, five things that we can all do to help bees and bumblebees um you know right from now what what would you say they are okay well i we, we tried to keep it simple um but there are five things in essence one is is planting more flowers and obviously we can come on to that later about the types of flowers that we may want to plant and and in planting more flowers what i often tell people is just to say well follow what the bees are doing if you look out and about you'll see bees on plants and invariably in your locality, those are the plants that are thriving and growing and those are the ones you should be planting for bees. The other thing I try to tell people is when planting flowers is to plant in clumps. Uh, the more of one species is, is often beneficial, both for honeybees and bumblebees um, and with different shaped flowers and we can come on to that. So that's the first thing about planting more flowers. Second is try and mow less. Um, we have a bit of a battle at home at times where I want to leave things just to <laughs> grow a bit, but uh, my wife's quite keen to have a fairly mown lawn. So we get, we, we compromise in that process. Um, you, can, you can always like have a, um, a compromise where you have part mown yes, and then part absolutely. wild, yeah. which can work quite well. Yeah, can't yeah it? absolutely. And that's what we've done. Um, you know, we, we've let, the, you know, and that's, that's the third point is allowing few areas to grow wild. Um, but there's, I think there's a difference between sort of really wild areas and, and, and managing a, a lawn for sort of a, a meadow type. So planting up more meadow species within your lawn and allowing them to flower. Um, the other key thing um, that we try to encourage people is to stop using pesticides. I know it's really hard um, and, and in the past I've used pesticides, but um, there's a lot of research as we know that neonicotinoids and other garden sprays and stuff really do damage to not just bumblebees, honeybees, but all our pollinators. So if that's one thing you can stop doing is, is stop using pesticides. 
In fact, the research has shown it, it does actually cause them brain damage, doesn't it? So they can't learn. And yes. So this is, so yes. Yeah. You lots think of that. It's quite devastating, isn't it? Yes, and there's, you know, there are, there, there is lots of research out there now that is demonstrating the clear links between uh, pesticides and, um, you know, the reduction in populations of insects. And the final one that we, we, we often talk about, but people don't necessarily think about, is that honeybee, uh, sorry, bumblebees um, hibernate over the winter. So it's about leaving um, hibernation sites for bees in your garden. Try and, you know, um, one of the things they tend to do is find an old mouse hole and go in there and nest, or they'll even dig into the ground underneath a plant. Um, and a couple of things that happened last year, uh, I was digging up my raised bed, um, a plant, and up came a, a, um, a bumblebee underneath it. It was hibernating right in the roots of this, of this plant. Um, and the other thing which I've just done in my garden is, is, is put in a new pond. Um, started it in the winter, dug up the turf, and up comes a, a, a bumblebee hibernating in the lawn itself. You know, it was a few inches down, but it was there quite happy. Fortunately, it was quite warm. She flew away off to hopefully find another, another space to hibernate. So hibernation sites are very critical for our queen bumblebees because ultimately they are the, um, the, the bumblebee that has mated and will produce the next generation. And what time of year would those queens be coming out of hibernation? You know, what, um, what time should you be extra careful for the period of hibernation? Yeah, it depends where, where you are, obviously, in the country. So I'm right down on the south coast. I notice a few people are in Scotland. So for me, bumblebees are actually often out throughout the whole year, depending on the climate. Um, so we need to make sure that there are winter plants available for, for those bees that are out and about. But generally speaking, in the south, it's February time um, that I will see honeybees, uh, bum bumblebees. Um, and, but as you move further north, um, colleagues, we have our head office in Scotland saying, you know, we don't see them until end of February, early March, or even later, depending on the weather. Yeah, if, you, if, if you'd like to put in the chat box, if or well, when you first started seeing these queen bumbles coming out of hibernation, we, perhaps we can do a tally at the end to see if that does correlate between where people are from when people first saw uh, queens coming out of hibernation. For, for me, Catherine, just as, a, as an aside, because I because I do a, a bee walk and I can explain a, a bit about bee walk later on. I was um, seeing uh, bumblebee queens, white tails and buff tails in February. Okay. Saw the first red tail uh, a couple of weeks ago and the first common carder today, in fact. So, so that's sort of the, the gradation of different species. They will, they will emerge you know, at different times of the year, there are some of the rarer species that sort of won't come out of hibernation until um, late April, early May, again, dependent on the weather. Um, so there's, there's that to bear in mind as well. Awesome. Okay, so if we're moving on a little bit more now into the, the gardening side of it, um, what, what would you say you would be wanting to specifically plant or examples of if you wanted to attract, say, specific pollinators. So if you wanted to attract bumbles to your garden, what would you advise us that we should be looking to plant? I'm going to I'm going to cop out of that question, actually, <laughs> partly because every garden is different and every garden is different. And even between couples, if you're married or, or with a partner, you have differences of opinion about what to plant and what not to plant. So I think what I'm just gonna to refer to for you to is some of the resources that I've found really helpful. Um, and I think it will uh, hopefully inspire people what to, what to plant in terms of the different species. But the first thing I think to think about is um, not just about flowers, but shrubs, trees, herbs, and vegetables. Um, and, 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 and fruits. One of the uh, things that I find that the bees just love in my garden is Logan breeze. I have a, I have a row of Logan breeze um, and they're all over it during, the, you know, when, when, it, when it's in flower. And, and one of the key things about vegetables, fruit and herbs is the more that a bee pollinates a plant, the better the quality and the more you get of a, of a, of a, a vegetable or a fruit. So that's something to bear in mind when you are thinking about planting. Some people like to, you know, just have vegetables and they're just as important as flowers at the end of the day because they do produce 
uh, flowers at a certain time. One of the things I'd like to um, uh, tell people about is Be Kind. Be Kind is a, a free app on our website, and I think you'll provide a link at the end of it. Um, we produce this app and it has 750 plants in it. Um, it has a range of categories and criteria that allows you one, to score your own garden, to say how bee friendly it is, but then it gives you suggestions and tips about what else to, uh, to plant. And you can search this database and it will give you a list and guidance, um, but you can search it on plant type, month of flowering, its origin. Um, and we also have um, a, a category there called super plants. So if you just wanted to see all the really super plants for bumblebees, you just click and it will come up with that list. And it's a great tool to uh, encourage one to see what how good you're doing. And secondly, what else you could plant as well. And it does give you insight into um, whether the plant would go well on types of soils or different types of soils, which is often important and aspect. So recommend you go and have a look at it. Um, well worth it. Um, and, uh, you know, as I say, I didn't particularly want to say definitely plant this because it may not be for the individual. The other thing I would recommend, and I um, forgot to mention earlier to you, Catherine, is that the one book that I have bought, and I don't know if people can see that, is, is, is The Bee Garden by Maureen Little. Uh, and basically it says how to create or adapt a garden to attract and nurture bees. And it, obviously at the same time, she, she comes up with the same sorts of lists, but the, what I like about it is the way that it's laid out. It does give you planting plans, gives you a gazetteer of, of plants, what they look like, when to plant and so on. Um, and also it, um, what's the other thing they, they, it comes up with as well? Um, it, it gives you plants for the different times of year as well. So you've got that range um, of um, plants that are necessary to keep um, uh, pollinators uh, in food and uh, nectar and pollen. We, we must have been thinking along the same theme because I've also got exactly the same kind of thing. I don't know if you've come across this one before, planting for honeybees. Right, uh, yes, I have, yes. So this is a lady who's a beekeeper as well and it's very similar to what you just said. It's um, It tells you the whole times of year, if you've got large garden, small garden, um, what to plant and gives you lots of really interesting ideas other than just flowers. Uh, because of course, um, particularly honeybees, if we're looking at honeybees, need quite a lot of forage. Um, so it's about thinking about trees and shrubs throughout the year as well as yes, the flowers. So uh, we'll put a link to these in the end so you can sort of know what we're talking about. But it's helpful to have a guide, particularly if you're starting from scratch, knowing where to start, isn't it, to have that resource. And I think, I think you know, buying books, I, I mean, I love books, but you can often end up with a whole shelf of books and, and they date and um, things change. And, and I, I have found some of the, the, the apps online um, about how, what to plant for, like, like Be Kind, it's just brilliant. Uh, it's constantly being updated and it's, it's, it's free accessible online. So yeah, well worth a look. Great, great tip. Okay, so now we're talking a little bit more deeply in terms of uh, the different foraging practices. And when we talk about foraging, we're talking about bees visiting flowers to collect uh, either nectar um, or pollen, um, so they don't necessarily go and feed, but they're collecting to take back to their nest. So that's what we call foraging. Um, so for example, if we're looking at the difference between honeybees and bumbles as that good comparator, how would these bees forage differently? And would they visit different plants and why? Can you give us an indication of those things? Yes, yeah, certainly. I, I suppose I, I, I look at two things. One is, which I mentioned before, is the furry coat. So bees have furry coats and they are conditioned to be in colder climates. So they're, um, they spend, they're out and about in, in that colder where, whereas honeybees tend to be out foraging, need to be above 10 degrees or thereabouts before they <laughs> decide to put their, their, their toes out of the, uh, out of the hive. Um, and the second thing is, is bizarrely is, is tongue length. Honeybees have a fixed tongue length of six millimeters whereas bumblebees have tongue lengths varying from six millimeters to 19 millimeters. So if you think of 19 millimeters, you know, that's two centimeters almost, it, it, it's curled around in its head. Um, but what that does do is allow certain species um, 
to um, feed on particular flowers. Um, and a good example is the foxglove. Um, it's the garden, um, there's the garden bumblebee is the only one that really um, feeds on foxgloves. There is a trick that many bumblebees have learned and so have honeybees is, to, is to, to nibble a hole at the back of the flower so that they access the, the nectar um, at, at the behind. So not going into the flower, they go behind it, uh, nibble a hole and access the nectar that way. Um, and you often see bees, other bees doing the same over and over again. So rather than going in and pollinating, they've learned the trick of, of uh, cutting a hole at the back. So it's important to ensure that, that you have a diversity of flowers uh, and, and, and some are you know, flat topped and are loved by honeybees. Some are uh, more, more bell shaped and are, are different species will access them, but it's all down to that tongue length. Um, so yes, it, it is about looking again, it still comes back down to the variety that you may want to do as a, a, be as a gardener um, and then thinking about shapes of the flower as well. Um, one of the things that I think Maureen does and also um, in her book and on Be Kind is say whether the flowers are good for pollen and nectar. Some flowers are a lot more um, important in terms of pollen and, and, and vice versa for nectar. So again, it's just look, you can look at that on the criteria and it's, it's, it's well worth looking at. And of course, the pollen's important as a protein food source, yes. For raising yes, the young. So yeah. that's the point really of them gathering the pollen as well as pollinating plants, but they have a, a need for it for a food source. Um, so yeah, and it's fascinating, isn't it, to see the different colours of pollens coming in on the bees when they've been collecting and working out where they visited, what yes. pollen uh, different yeah. plants have. And it's really quite surprising. You can have some flowers which are a completely different colour as a petal to the pollen that's in, inside. Yes. Yes, I, 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 last year or was it the year before, I, I attended a, a local beekeeping um, uh, training event uh, and, and, and there was a talk by a professor um, who, who used pollen, um, not necessarily for studying bees, but for studying criminology. And oh. it's, this, it's this factor that, that pollen has is all sorts of shapes and different sizes and obviously it can attach to the legs and the bodies of bees in different ways. But yes, he, he's employed by uh, the criminal justice system to look at forensic evidence about pollen and what pollen may be on in individuals' clothing. And, and that is used as evidence against uh, or, or convicting criminals. But it was a fascinating talk um, about pollen and criminology at the end of the day. So <laughs> you wouldn't something think very, it, would you? No, something very different, very different indeed. Fabulous. And perhaps people will put in the chat what particular plants they've noticed in their gardens that have um, drawn the bees in, whether it be bumbles or honeybees or solid bees, and whether those are plants that they planted or whether they're natural wild plants, so hedgerow type plants. So what is it that you're noticing in your own gardens or in your surroundings when you're going for a walk, which is drawing those bees? We'll do a little tally of the top plants of um, bee attractiveness, if you can call it that, uh, which we'll include in our email as well. Okay, moving on. So another interesting fact is that sometimes, um, for example, wildflowers can all bloom in one point in the summer months, which is brilliant. But there is a period of time which is longer than just that period where bees need access to forage. So how important is it to think about planting to cover different periods or months in the year to create a forage source for bees? I think, it, um... Uh, it, it, it's, it's crucial really because obviously the, the, the flower, the, it's important to have sort of native plants and obviously there's a lot of advocation for native plants, but equally non-native species are just as important. And I'm, I'm a, I may be a bit more relaxed about saying, well, actually, as long as the plant isn't an invasive species, um, non-natives are fine because they do contribute a lot to supporting our bumblebees, more so in gardens, um, in our towns and cities than in the countryside, um, because at times our countryside is, is a desolate place, it's a monoculture. So to have that variety is very important. One of the things that we're, um, we, we've just started um, uh, in, uh, in January actually is a, is a Be The Change campaign. Uh, and Be The Change is about, uh, it's, a, it's an online campaign and we've got a website and it will be part of the, um, part of the uh, resources um, 
we're giving away free resources about what people can do in, micro, in terms of micro actions for bumblebees. And one of the things we've, we've started is to have a bumblebee menu, menu every month. So what that means is we've got two up at the moment. One is a bumblebee menu for March and, and April, and it's about when to plant. Uh, we often see when flowers are in bloom, but often people don't think about when they should be planting them in time for that. So, so that is a bit of a crossover that we're, we're trying to encourage people to think about when they should plant so that the flowers are in that right time. Um, and you did mention earlier about the June gap um, uh, for honeybees in particular. So again, it's about identifying flowers and using the resources that are you know, at our disposal to say, well, can we find space to, to have plants that are flowering in that particular time? And the, the, the challenge here is about seasons. Um, I was noticing on um, Monty Don um, last week where he was saying that his, his daffodils are in full bloom. Mine are over almost. So he's in Herefordshire, I'm down on the south coast. My, my period is a lot earlier than his. So, you know, we need to think about that as well in terms of timing um, for um, when to plant. But I suppose general principles, if you look across the spectrum, it's about planting trees and shrubs in Oct through from October to March in their dormant season and, and seeds in that spring and autumn to get a progression of, of, of plants throughout the year. Tend to plant it takes print. quite some planning, really, doesn't it? If you want to do a decent job, um, you know, to plan how all these things are it, 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 it is, and I haven't got it right yet. Um, I tend to try and go with nature to see what's happening at the time. I noticed somebody talked about geraniums and dandelions. You know, there's a whole spectrum of plants out there that if you can incorporate local wildflowers, then it will help you in your, your quest to sort of have plants available all the year round. Brilliant. Okay. I mean, so if that's, I, so, yeah, sorry, carry on. No. Sorry, were you going to? No, we can I'm, come on to the next question. That's fine. Okay. So um, we sort of touched on the life cycle of the bee in terms of when the queens would come out of hibernation and when mm. that was slightly different depending where you were in the country. Can you just sort of um, perhaps go through in just a little bit more detail of the actual life cycle of the bumblebee, for example? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, it's a cycle so where do you start the beginning or the end uh, I suppose for me it's about let's let's start with the spring spring is when obviously the queens emerge they have been mated in the autumn um, so they go and hibernate during the the, the the winter months and and here they'll they'll emerge in February some may not actually hibernate at all um, and and and, and she, the, the key thing for her then is to two things one is to find nectar and pollen and in my garden, I'm very fortunate that I have a, a hedgerow full of old plums. They're, they're all the old Mirabelle's cherry plum types. And they, they blossom in February, very early on. Uh, and they are awash with uh, bumblebees and honeybees uh, because they are an early flowering tree. The other key tree that I would recommend if you've got space is any form of willow. Um, they produce their cactins early, cact early on. And again, bumblebees love it. Um, I know um, early on in the year, it was, it was a wash with bumblebees, queen, all queen bees, just gathering that nectar and pollen so that she can build up reserves and resources to start her nest. And the next thing she will do is try and look for a nest site. So if you're out and about and you'll see a bumblebee in your garden and she's fairly large hovering about the, the lawn or, or along the hedgerow, she's effectively looking for somewhere to, to nest and it will be underground. And she'll use um, probably a, um, a, an old uh, mouse nest, mouse hole. Um, some obviously go under sheds, um, but it's, it's, it's invariably underground or in tussocky grass. So some species are slightly above ground in, in moss tussocky grass. Uh, and so she will start that process of building a nest um, during that spring um, so that she will produce a workers um, first thing round to um, who will hatch and then go out and help build the nest up further and that her, the, the the cycle is about 10 to 12 weeks and as you near the sort of the middle of the summer or end of summer um, she will change from producing workers to males those males will will, will grow and uh, at some point they will leave the nest um, and uh, start looking for new queens that are coming out of similar nests of similar species. 
um, they will mate, the whole colony will die off, except for those meaty queens. By September, October time, she'll start looking for a, um, a place to hibernate and the cycle starts all over again. And like um, bears hibernating or any other hibernating creature, do they have to build up their kind of energy reserves to survive the winter? Or how does that work? Oh, that's a good scientific question. Um, I'm going to say um, they, they will build up their reserves. They do slow their metabolism. And I, yes. if, my, if my memory correct it serves me, I'm not necessarily a scientist on bees, but um, they will produce uh, antifreeze effectively to stop them from um, um, freezing to death as well. So, that, you know, their, their, their temperature goes, you know, right down. Yeah. Um, and you often see bees, out if they are out and about, they, they've um, disconnected their wings and they shiver or they're vibrating yeah. their wings to build up that heat within their body. Um, and will, will bumbles do that similar kind of thing? Because yes, we know will. how the yes. honeybees yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yes. uh, amazing, isn't it, how nature knows how to survive. People often worry about, um, you know, when it's bad weather, for example, with the snow, you know, how the bees going to survive. And I always say, you know, the bees were here a long time before us and they know <laughs> what they're doing. It's just us that doesn't know what we're doing, isn't it? So nature uh, is, is amazing. Uh, yes, I, I, and, and I think um, sort of honeybee, well, I found with my honeybees, they, they can cope with the cold adequately. Yeah. What they don't like is the wet yeah. and cold. Yeah. So I tend to wrap mine up at least to protect them from the rain, not too worried about the cold. And both my colonies have got through the winter quite happily yeah. um, this year. And so. also it's the condensation, isn't it? So yes. rather yeah. than wrapping in plastic, you know, yeah. I've got um, uh, natural wool insulation in the roof then. So the, you know, the moisture can leave and it's not stuck in there making them damp. Uh, yes, I, I, I use a type of hive uh, called a worry hive um, and, and uh, based on ML worries um, principles. Um, and basically I use uh, sawdust and hessian. And yeah. so any of the, 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 the heat is, is escapes through that process. But of course, in nature, they would know what to do. They wouldn't need us caretaking. No, They'd absolutely be in the hollow not. of a tree and it would all be natural. <laughs> so, you know, they still know more than us. They know better than us. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> OK. OK, so moving on now to say we've got the, the book, we've made a plan. We know when we're going to plant. In terms of actually purchasing the plants, are there any things we should be looking out for? You know, because we know if you go to a garden centre, we know, um, you know, plants will say be friendly on them. Is that enough? Do we need to look for origin, as you've always meant, already mentioned, sort of whether they're native or not? Do they need to be fertile? Do we need to look at the source of plants? You know, what kind of things would you suggest we should be looking for on purchasing plants? Some key things, really. One is, um, I've already alluded to the fact that I, I am fairly relaxed about non-native species, but native and non-native are important. Origin of seeds, if you're wanting to, you know, uh, plant flowers, use seeds rather than flowers. So native provenance is, is, is quite important because they will be seeds that are um, accustomed to the local area and has a better, stance, a better chance of success. Um, one of the things that's been really pushed at the moment is about uh, getting garden centres and DIY stores to um, not buy plants that have been grown with pesticides. You, it may say be friendly, but what, what in, uh, recently plants we found that, um, you know, they've used um, insecticides and, and, and herbicides to grow those plants on uh, and they're in the root systems. So that's something that's worth checking. Um, Another important thing, if, if you are purchasing plants, um, is, is about, you know, t take the plant out of the pot, check its root system, check its good quality rather than something that's quite feeble. Um, I, I tend not to buy plants from plant garden centres. I tend to liaise with friends and, and, you know, family about what they have in their gardens. Um, occasionally take the odd cutting and get it growing. Um, so I think there's lots of different ways you can do things than other than just, you know, purchasing plants. Um, the other source that I have found and I'm, I'm very keen to get back to um, is, got, is, is car boot sales. Oh. Uh, my local car boot sales, uh, uh, there are a number of um, nurseries that sell plants at ridiculously cheap prices. Um, so I buy, if, if I buy lavender, they will be £1.50 each for a three, three litre pot. Very, very cheap compared to a, a garden centre that may be, you know, eight or nine pounds. So, you know, look for other ways of, of, of purchasing uh, purchasing plants if possible. Great tips there, definitely. Yeah, it can soon mount up, can't it, the old cost of a garden centre? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. 
And I like that idea of being more community minded and sharing with each other. Um, I'm sure it's got to have some eco advantage there on carbon footprints and all that kind of thing as well. And one of the things I've, I've, I've sort of increasingly been doing is, as I'm out and about walking is, you know, if I'm doing my bee walk or elsewhere, you know, when, when plants are in seed, you know, they're ready to seed, a handful of seeds taken back and sown on, um, you know, I don't think hurts at all. So, um, you know, again, it's just different ways of uh, getting local plants that you know are growing well in your area. Yeah, definitely. Great tip. OK. Um, now, this is a time of year we've talked about um, the queens coming out of hibernation. One of the biggest queries we get this time of year in terms of bee care is I found a struggling bee in my garden. What can I do about it? Mm -hmm. And maybe people are not quite sure what's going on. Why is it that the bee is struggling? Do they need help? Should we interfere? Shouldn't we? What's your view about what we can do to help and what's actually going on with these bees? Uh, so it, it, often with bees emerging early in the season they may be lacking um you know energy and so and if you if they're if they're lacking flowers in the garden at that time of year then then yes by all means give them um some sort of sustenance um it's often talked about sugar water or sugar feeding and that's a simple solution of um uh, 50 50 of, of sugar and water uh, i've tried it quite a few times actually and the bees don't seem that interested um <laughs> Some are um, some are just just ill. I've often I've found a few bees with a lot of mites on them, um, so it's possible that they are weak and old, and that you know they nothing will you know will 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 save them. Um, I always try to encourage people to if you've got low flowers to put the bees on the flowers, and I've done that in the past. Picked them up, put them on a dandelion, and within a few minutes they're you know they're feeding on the dandelion. Um, the other thing I have done is uh, because I, I, I keep honeybees, I've got natural honey, I don't treat my bees with any chemicals or anything. Um, so I've tried honey as well. Um, and every time I've used that, the bee, bumblebees love it. So that's certainly a possibility. There's always a danger that honey, uh, there may be diseases within honey that, that may be passed on to bumblebees. So you, we do, do just have to bear that in mind. But certainly um, I'd rather try and save something than just yeah. let it die. So yeah. flowers first, sugar water, or maybe even be honey if the sugar water doesn't work. And sometimes I've noticed they can be caught out. So say they're out for the day, the temperature drops, yeah. or they get caught often inside. So if the windows open, the doors open, they get caught inside a house. And then when it's early morning or late at night, they become very dozy, don't they? Because the yes. temperature drops. And actually all they need to do is warm up in the morning yes. it's not yeah. necessary and it's amazing how if you just wait a little bit try them with some sugar water and then leave them somewhere warm they can start regaining their energy yes indeed yeah no and and you know I, I, i've done that a few times indoors with uh, and i've just left the bees uh, on a on a on a saucer with the sugar water or the honey they've lapped it up um they've started their you know exercises to warm up and then they're off and out of the house. It's nothing so. more rewarding than seeing them fly <laughs> off like that. I opened the front door um, a couple of days ago and one had obviously come inside on Sunday because it was so warm, um, got trapped inside, opened the door and it was sort of got tumbled around and couldn't quite get its wings to work, yeah. her, her wings. Um, so she just needed a moment to get the wings working again. So she, yes. she was on the end of my slipper just trying to get these wings working. And then eventually she was like off and it was just really rewarding to see her go on her way Brilliant. so um okay um okay we're sort of coming to the end of our, our sort of list of um um questions here we will then go on to a couple of questions that my customers um had given me when we first organized this we'll go through and then we'll start delving into some of the questions um that have been left on the chat box so the last thing really is uh, what if our listeners are saying, yes, I want to do all this in the garden, or perhaps I'm already doing it, or I know what I'm doing there, but I want to get more involved. I'd love to do more. What are the ways that they can become more involved with the Bumblebee Conservation Trust in helping bees and bumbles? You know, what are the schemes going on at the moment? Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, I mentioned Be the Change early on. That's a, a one year national campaign um, to get. Um, it, 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 some of the challenges about sometimes we, we, we preach to the converted and, and, you know, looking at the chat as we go do a lot of people giving some really good advice. We want to try and get those people that really don't know about gardening or, or bees 
So Be The Change is about just giving some simple tips, actions that people can do for the benefit and just start that process. What we found is that um, telling people they had to become a member or do a bee walk just seemed a bit daunting. So it's about getting the people on the, the first step of the ladder and it's about getting them to do simple actions, just like planting flowers in it, or it may be uh, fruit and vegetables, um, or just sending in a picture of a bumblebee, just to spark that interest. So be the change is, is, is what it's all about. And there'll be, um, as I said earlier, the resources are all free um, and they will be constantly updated throughout the year. Um, um, and I, funny enough, I, was, I was looking on just before I came online, I thought, oh, that's a new resource. I'll have a look at that. So even, you know, each time you learn a bit more, learn a bit more. Uh, and I think the Bumblebee menus will be great because I think people sometimes are a bit, you know, what do I need to do this month? Well, Bumblebee menu in March, is this is what you could be doing. Uh, so it's, and it's simply laid out. So uh, hopefully we can gauge more people uh, through that. Um, I mentioned about um, uh, one of the projects we have got um, and obviously because you're in Wales, Catherine, I said I'd mentioned was the Skills for Bees project in Wales. We're very fortunate that a, a, a charitable foundation in Wales um, is fully funding the project for three years, um, which is brilliant. We've got a, um, a lovely lady called Claire Flynn um, and, and the details are on our website and I know you'll put them in the resources, but um, she's looking for um, two things. One is she's going to be surveying sites to look for rare bees. But secondly, we're running a lot of running free courses about bumblebee identification um, and also about how to set up a bee walk. Now, bee walk is our national monitoring scheme that's been running for uh, 10 years. It's um, it, what it tells us is about the abundance and distribution of bumblebees. So there's a very scientific method to it, um, but it's relatively simple. And for me, it's uh, what, what we ask people to do is to walk. Uh, you choose a route, you define a route, you set it out, and you walk that route once a month between March and October. You, you, you can do many more, but the minimum is one month, and record not only the bumblebee species, but the cast as well. And by the cast, I mean whether it's a queen, a worker, uh, or a male. Um, and if you're proficient enough to record the flower that it may be on, if it is on a flower. Um, that, wor that, that work um, all that data is then drawn into a central database and it starts to give us a picture of what, um, what is happening to our bumblebees in this country. Um, and one good example um, is the tree bumblebee. Now that's an introduced species about 15 years ago. Um, and what we've done is just seen the migration of that species northwards. Um, and it's now, I think it is now in Scotland, 99% certainly is in Scotland, but it started off um, it, in the south and it's just worked its way northwards uh, and we've been able to show that so it, it's not just about uh, the common bumblebees it's also about the rare bees as well so excellent project go on our website um, Claire would love to hear from you if you're in Wales uh, and, 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 and take the opportunity of those free free training free opportunities there that sounds really exciting you know to get involved with um, and rewarding as well knowing that you're doing something to help you know absolutely once, once a month Yes, and I think one of our, you know, the other thing we do do is have projects all over the country. Again, they're all listed on our, um, uh, our website under our work. Um, so we've got projects in Scotland for the Great Yellow. Um, a new one that's hopefully coming on stream next year in Wales is Natura Bith, uh, which is all about the Shrill Carder Bee uh, and many other species of uh, animals. It's not just about bumblebees. We're working in partnership, but we've got them in Cornwall, Devon, uh, Kent, Derbyshire, uh, and we're constantly trying to develop and get funding for new projects. So wherever you are, there may be an opportunity for you to get involved in yeah, some so of our work. Yeah, something to satisfy all of Absolutely. our lovely yeah. listeners. Yeah, very much so. Fabulous. Right, so I'm just going to move on to some of the questions that we have already had, and then um, I'll get some chat box. So first question we had was from Sonia. Sonia, I hope you're listening. Um, otherwise, we, don't forget, we'll, we'll have a recording. So Sonia asks, um, I've got a small back garden that's all gravel and stones. Um, so she's got pots, but there's a small area, she says, goes to the back fence between uh, her garden and the railway line. Uh, there are trees that are already a bit overgrown, but they're wanting to plant a few more things for bees. There is quite a bit of shade there. Um, have you got any ideas for her as to what she could plant in that area that would be bee friendly? 
I, I'm quite, I mean, depending on whether uh, Sonia has, ac- uh, I'm not sure if she has access to this piece of ground. Um, I wasn't sure whether it was outside her property and, and, and against the, the, the railway line. So it's on railway, r- railway property. Um, but I, I would always try, I always try and get fruit in everywhere. Uh, one, because I love it. Yeah. Uh, if there's an opportunity to grow, um, you know, um, fruit bushes or um, black, um, Logan breeze, black breeze, great. One of the things I do have in my garden, which I think is, is fantastic, and you can train it very well, is a, a thornless blackberry. Um, which I, I, I purchased from actually from a, um, a garden centre, uh, no thorns on it, beautiful blackberries, bumblebees and honeybees love it. Um, and it stays relatively compact or I, or I train it along the fence. So right. that's certainly worth thinking about is if you can, because blackberries can survive in most places um, in terms of uh, ideally the prefer sun, but you will find them anywhere. But, but yeah, if there's the opportunity to plant uh, different things other than flowers think about fruit. you know different types of fruits or um uh, yes yeah, so i've I, you know the it's an old type of pl- i have actually about 12 different varieties of old plum in my garden um and, and they're they're relatively small trees again but they produce beautiful white blossom um and the plums well i always make plum jam um and a few other um, drinks as well with my with my plums so you know, I always tend to encourage people to plant more, you know, food, fruit uh, for, the, for their garden. And often that can um, that can blossom earlier in the year as well, can't it? Like with the apple, for example. The, well, the plum is, my, the plum in, in my garden's over already. It does February, March. Yeah. Uh, my apple isn't out yet. So it, it does that first chunk for, 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 for pollinators. It's, it, it's lovely. Um, as I say, they're OK to eat, but they're better jammed. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, hopefully that's answered Sonia's question. So the next question we have is from Michelle. She's in Cambridgeshire and um, she has a heavy clay soil. So we were talking about um, different soil types earlier and also north facing. So the aspects we were looking at. Uh, She's got a north facing garden, but she's got a south facing front bit. She was toying with the idea of digging out and um, uh, covering it with sort of weed suppressed gravel. Um, to help with water retention she wanted to plant some bee friendly plants and flowers that won't be uh, would survive in the harshness of the south facing area and also manage this sort of rocky sandy ground any ideas for her um i I suppose i have three (laughs) first one is just go to be kind um and and have a look at what really survives in those conditions secondly is work with nature rather than against it so really think twice about doing all that work um, that, that may be a struggle in the end and probably cost, possibly quite costly. Um, but I suppose if she's got a gravelly, hot, sunny area, then we may be wanting to look at me- more of the Mediterranean plants yeah. um, that, that you know, can su- survive in dry areas. One of the things I do plant, and I try to plant it all over the place, um, and the bees love it, is, is marjoram and oregano. Nice. Um, I, I've, I've got shrub and I've, I've just put some in my in my meadow area as well. Um, but the, the bees over that period of time, um, when it's in flower, it, it, it's just covered. Um, and interestingly, one of the things I learned about uh, the the the, um, the the active ingredient in in Oregon is thymol, and thymol is is also um, very good for for bee health and, and uh, protecting bees. So it's probably why they're, they're, they, they know that themselves exactly. probably, uh, and have taken it back for, for, for their, um, the health of their, their hive or all their colonies. The same applies to thyme, doesn't it? Yes. You know, yes. so these, these herbs are, again, nature knows the health, there's not just forage, they know the health benefits yes, to them absolutely. and to their colony of bringing these plants in. So herbs can be underrated in, in terms of the importance for bees, I think. Um, I've got um, I've got the same, similar thing. I've got a south-facing front and I've got um, pots with herbs in, but I also transplanted my rosemary into the gravel. Uh, mm-hmm. I've got weed-suppressed gravel, exactly the same as Michelle was describing. But what I've noticed is the back of the rosemary plant has started dying off and I started looking into it and wondered if it might be suffering with root rot with, in terms mm, okay. of all the rain we've had. Right, so yes. Uh, certainly a possibility but like like you I have my rosemary in the gravel 
Um, it seems to thrive quite well. I've got a, I've got a viburnum behind it. Um, so that, um, so obviously that's sucking up water as well. So maybe you need, may need to do some companion planting. I'm not sure. But again, viburnum is uh, viburnum tinus is very good for, for, for bees as well. Again, fairly early flowering, um, and it just pro provides that additional resource. Um, the other plant that I have planted in my graveled areas is sedums. Um, again, in the autumn, bees just love sedums. Um, and, they, and they're very robust plants that can cope with quite harsh, dry conditions. Um, but yeah, yeah like, I, I would yeah. tend to look at Mediterranean herbs, you know, are quite, yeah. uh, quite a, a good mix of, of, of different plants. Yeah, in fact, um, in Europe and in France, you often have entire fields of one herb and get the one style of honey, don't you? So you can get a thyme yes. honey, you yeah. can get a, a rosemary honey, you can get lavender, obviously yeah. everyone's heard of the lavender honeys, um, but they make quite distinctive flavours. Okay, and the last uh, question we have here is from Diane. Hi, Diane, if you're watching. Um, I have no garden. So this applies to people who've got smaller spaces. So these are ideas for what we can do if you've literally got no space or just a small balcony. So Diane's got a small balcony. Um, last year, she grew sunflowers. I've got my sunflowers just sprouting in their seedlings upstairs on the windowsill now. So I haven't <laughs> grown them before. So I'm quite excited to do those this year. That, make, that makes two of us, actually. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mine have just come up. So uh, I was a bit late planting. They've literally, yeah, the first one came out in the morning last Saturday. And by the end of the day, the whole lot of them have come through. If I had put a camera on them, they literally would have gone. Doo -doo -doo -doo. It's incredible how quickly <laughs> yeah, they've come through. Good. I'm very yes. impressed. And in fact, and I, I, I didn't buy any seeds. I, 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 during the winter months, I feed birds. Um, with seed okay uh, and I just I just took a handful of the sunflower seeds stuck it in the soil and and so far six of the eight have all come up just like yours they're all all popping up at the same time Brilliant. So I'm amazing. really impressed yeah. so I mean obviously the bees are going to love those when they come out and they're going to look beautiful as well so I'm quite excited about that but Diane has has previously grown sunflowers and again says the bees love them and she's also got lavender of course all bees like, like the lavender what other bee friendly plants can she try when you've got a small space so again, I think I would go back to, to sort of part of the previous questions is, is again, looking at herbs. It, it depends if she wants, uh, you know, if she wants a medicinal garden or a herbal garden on her balcony. The oregano marjoram to me is a must. Um, equally chives produce good uh, flowers or any of the alums produce good flowers and the bees tend to love those. Um, uh, the other thing I, I would suggest, we've, we've just put on, again, the Be The Change uh, website, a leaflet about growing in different places, and one of them is balconies. So it gives you some insight into the types of flowers that you may want to plant, um, depending on your space. Uh, and, and it does talk about herbs. It talks about fruit as well. Strawberries is another thing you could grow. Um, um, and, and also flowers that, that may be suitable for balconies. So, so have a look at that. I did, I did see... Sorry, one oh. of the things I did see, which which I, I, I might try this year, um, was a Dave Goulton tip. Um, he was he was on Gardener's World um, and he was growing a bird's foot trefoil in pots. A bird's foot trefoil is a, is a very um, valuable plant for, for a certain species of bumblebee. Uh, but he it, it's a it's a yellow flower and it was it's quite trailing o over the pots. Um, but it seemed to be doing very, very well. So that may be worth trying. Bees love it. It is one of the core staples, uh, stable plants in the countryside. So it's bird's foot trefoil. Excellent. I suppose the key message is, um, because I've had, you know, customers have said before, there's nothing really I can do because I haven't got any space, but actually everyone can do something, can't they? No matter how limited yeah. the space is, yeah. there is, there are still things that you can do. So it's encouraging oh, for us. And, de and depending on the balcony, you know, think about height as well. Um, you know, growing uh, runner beans, dwarf beans, again, the bees um, love the flowers. Um, tomatoes, if there's space, um, you know, tomato, bumblebees are the only bee that pollinates um, tomatoes. So, um, you know, that is, that is, that is quite important. So yeah, maybe look at, um, you know, different vegetables that you could grow. Nice. And um, you say you get the benefit of being able to eat them. Absolutely. So, so always a win-win, isn't it? Yes, we can indeed. all win. <laughs> yes. Okay, so just got delving into the chat box now. And don't forget, don't worry if we can't get through them all. We will be, Nigel's agreed to deal with any outstanding questions, which we will send on to you in the email. So don't forget to click that link to be ensure uh, to get a copy of this recording and any outstanding 
um, answers. So from Michael. Hi, Michael. Michael said, is it useful to put water out for bees and what's the best way of doing that? Yeah, we hadn't actually covered the whole water bath thing for bees. What would you say bees, that? bees do need water. Um, I, I, interestingly, I've, I've uh, as I said, uh, put a pond in last year. Um, I've been in, very interested to see what, what turns up, um, apart from two ducks and a heron in the first week. Um, what, what seems to do really well at the pond I, I, is just covered with honeybees gathering water for their hives. Haven't seen many bumblebees or solitary bees, but certainly uh, honeybees seem to, right on the edge, just above the water line, sucking in the, uh, uh, you know, today I was out just having a look and there was a good 20 or 30 honeybees all taking in water and taking it, oh, sorry, I assume they're my bees, take, yes. taking it back to the hive. So um, they seem so, to, when they find a water source, I don't know if you find this with yours, but they seem to, one finds it, then they go back and tell all their friends and then they all come. If you sit there watching and it's a yes, new water, yeah. we've got a, like a, a stone water trough fountain thing, just a little, okay. you know. Yep. And yeah, you watch, we sit there in the summer and one will come, and, as you say, right on the edge, just by the water line and suck down and then goes back and then they all start coming then. And exactly in the same spot as well. They'll all come just at the same yes. spot. They won't just go anywhere around it. It's funny, isn't it? Very good. So it's worthwhile um, if there isn't any natural water considering putting out water. But the important thing is that the bees can drown if they haven't got something to yeah. stand on. Yes. So and, and oh, sorry. Also, the, 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 the important thing is if you can collect rainwater rather than tap water. Um, rainwater is obviously much more natural. Um, take it from a water butt and put it in an appropriate appropriate location. You know, that's one way of doing it. Um, if you do use tap water, um, what they say in terms of the chemicals in the water is if you leave it for 24 hours, most of those have dissipated. So um, don't don't put in instant water out. Let it let it um, let it, I suppose, rest or settle for, for oh, that's a, for a while. great tip. I hadn't thought about that. Brilliant. OK, hopefully that's answered your question, Michael. Um, from Jessica now. Hi, Jessica. Um, Jessica's asking, what are your thoughts on buying bumblebee houses? We've ta already talked about their natural life cycle and how they'll burrow into ground. Would a bumblebee use one of these like bee hotels or would it be worth um, having those for other types of bees? What's your thoughts on that? OK, so so the key thing here and again, a mis misconception, those bee hotels are great, but they're for solitary bees. Bumblebees do not use as far as I'm aware, those types of bee hotels where you've got lots of little holes everywhere, very well used by, by solitary bees. Um, there is one particular bumblebee that will use nest boxes, and that's the tree bumblebee. So if you've got a, a, a blue tip nest box up, I've had them in my garden, uh, the tree bumblebee will use those. Then there's this third thing called a bumblebee house. And I noticed a lot of garden centers and other um, businesses starting to sell them and sell them with colonies as well. Um, we haven't, as an organization, formed a definitive point of view on it, but we're not encouraging people to do it. Um, and part of the reason is, is those colonies uh, are of a particular species of bumblebee. Um, and they may bring in um, disease and other viruses uh, into uh, the natural colonies and may cause problems. So the, the colonies are reared in, in particular locations, um, sent out obviously in the post to people, uh, the, the, the colony's there for one year, the whole colony dies, and you've got to start that process again. So you then have to go and buy another colony. And so we're introducing, um, uh, whilst it's, uh, it, it is of the generally the uh, white-tailed bumblebee, uh, Bombus odax odax, uh, Lucorum od odax odax, it's, it, we're not encouraging it as an organisation. Oh. It was far better to provide the right resources locally uh, and um, sites for bumblebees to nest rather than introducing um, species that have been mass produced effectively uh, in right. a warehouse somewhere. So it's worthwhile um, considering making, I'm going to have a go actually on the weekend making, um, uh, I was looking at some resources for uh, making um, a bee hotel style. And it's quite interesting when you look into it about what you need to do to actually make it a viable home for solitary yes. bees, for yep, example, absolutely. Yes. you know, positioning, 
um, sh shelter so the rain can't get in, otherwise it's useless. It, and also about having to clean it out yes. each year. So yeah, used so. holes need to be, because it can store disease and things. Yeah. So yeah. there's a bit of management involved. You can't just bung it up, can you? So, uh, absolutely. Um, no, there's, there's a lot more involved if you want to be, you know, want it to be effective. Yeah. Um, we do have a resource on online under Be The Change Again about um, some people are trying to provide bumblebee homes with with pops pots underground with a tube and, and and filled with moss or fine hair trying to mirror mimic a um, a bee's a, 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 a mouse's nest um it has been successful but limited but you know there, there are ways of trying um to provide opportunities uh, for our local natural colonies rather than buying in new ones at the end of the day I mean, it's, I suppose, going back to our original part of the discussion where we were saying, if you can leave parts of your garden to yeah. be as natural as possible, nature will find its way, won't it? Yes, it will. Habitat. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Very much. Okay. Okay. Now we're moving on to a question from Rosie and Ali. Hi there. Um, so these lovely ladies are in Manchester. They would love to get involved with beekeeping. They haven't got any experience. Is there a place or courses you know of where they can learn more and... Um, Oh, ask me, how did I get into beekeeping? So, Nigel, you can start us off <laughs> with... Um, I, I, I would, with... I, yeah, I, the two things. One, one is um, visit the BBKA website, the British Beekeeping uh, Association website. They have county, they generally have county uh, organisations uh, across the country that will run training days um, that will introduce you to beekeeping. Most of them have training apries as well. Um, so that you can learn and experience it and just double check that it's right for you. <laughs> you know, often when you've, you, you know, you, look, you take off the, 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 the top of a hive and you suddenly have thousands of bees flying around you, um, it can freak some people out at the end of the day. Um, so that's a good place to start. If you want to be a more hands-off beekeeper, um, there is the Natural Beekeeping Trust, um, and, and there's different types of hive that you can use. Um, it, it, and it depends on how you want to be, whether you want to be very hands on with your beekeeping or very hands off. I'm very hands off, tend to let the bees do it themselves. Uh, they do swarm, but I generally catch the swarms and put them in new hives. Um, I don't I don't clip wings or anything like that. Don't introduce chemicals. So it is a more um, um, Natural, natural way of yeah exactly. natural way of managing them but I certainly think, I, it, it's good to have an introduction to beekeeping and the the implications and the practicalities um, i think I, it's it's so starting from a base like starting with the bbka so every county has yeah. these organizations that you can go on taste of days like as nigel said and go to courses and you learn a base amount of knowledge and then you can develop on from there i found so if you're more of a like nature to take its course, you can sort of developing your develop your beekeeping practices um, from that starting point. So you know where, where to take it. I'm like you, I've become very more natural um, wanting the bees to behave as naturally as they can yeah. and have less involvement from us. Because I yeah. firmly believe that they know far more what they're doing. In fact, we're the problem, aren't we humans? Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. There's a great book, which I'll also pop in the chat box called Songs of Increase. It's like from a bee whisperer in America. Right. And it's fascinating because it really gives you an insight into how bees behave um, in terms of how they communicate um, naturally. So, you know, it, it's a little bit woo woo, but she, you know, she she communicates with the bees and will ask them questions. But I love this kind of thing. And she'll say, you know, so why is it that you don't like plastic foundation? So foundation is what you put in the hives to help the bees start drawing their wax out to either store honey or put the larvae in uh, or the eggs to go into larvae. Um, and uh, she said the bees told her that, um, <laughs> you know, the vi vibration. But the thing is, all the answers she, she said, I'm like, yes, I totally get it. <laughs> bees use vibration to communicate and they can't vibrate as well through these plastic sheets of foundation as they could through their own natural wax. You, you see, you listen to this and you think, gosh, that makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. So I love this book. If you, if you like that kind of thing, I'll put it in the links. So you can read about it. But it really opens your mind up to n nature and how nature operates without us. Gives yeah. you a sort of slightly different feel. And, yeah. and I've done exactly the same with the, the you know, the worry hive, the, 
the, the type of hive they use. All it has is, is eight in each, each box. It has eight top bars uh, with a bit of wax to start it. And the rest is all natural comb. So, uh, and one of the benefits of that is that you, if you take honey out of it, and I only take it if it's, if, if the bees have enough to get through the winter, um, is that you, you take the, the, the top bar as it is with the whole comb. And in order to get the honey, you have to, um, ex, you know, crush and strain. So all the comb is destroyed. But what that does is actually it takes all out the disease as well. Exactly. Any, yeah. any disease that's in the, in the, in the comb is, is removed. Um, and, and within a few weeks, they'll have produced, I put another top bar in and, and they produced um, an, a new comb within, within weeks. Yeah, no, there's lots of practices we can do which can help. And just talking about another resource, um, I'm sure you know of Bridget, Bridget Strawbridge. Yes, I've got that um, one on my, I had my Christmas yeah. present. <laughs> so this is another one, Dancing with Bees. Um, yeah. This lady is a sort of natural gardener and a bumblebee advocate. And I once uh, went to one of her talks years ago about how she described the bumblebee's warning system with the legs. Because often you yes. see on social media, oh, look at this bumblebee, it's saying hi, because it's lifted its leg. Actually, no, that's its warning. Please yes. don't come any further. But they really are resistant to stinging, aren't they? They're so gentle. And they'll yes. give you so many warnings before they finally would resort to stinging. Um, I think they're brilliant creatures. I love them. But yeah, so yeah. that's a, an interesting read too. And, and just on the sting bit, yes, I mean, bumblebees very rarely sting, although I have been stung when I dug one up, hibernating, so I can understand that. Yes. <laughs> um, their sting um, hasn't got a barb like the honeybee, so a bumblebee can carry on stinging, whereas a honeybee, once stung, it dies. So um, Unless you're very, very patient, and sometimes it can unwind itself, can't yeah, it? Yeah, I haven't got but the patience, but I've so been stung. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard to be relaxed, isn't it, when you're in the process of being stung, just going, yes, just remove it. Um, okay, so we're going to another question here from Colleen Goff. Hi, Colleen. Colleen is asking, I'm shortly going to be turning our gravel garden into a lawn, turf, not seed. It's a high traffic area, so can't do time, lawn or similar, but I still want some variety in there. If I scatter flower seeds, maybe clover on the bare soil before turf goes down, will they come through the lawn or is the grass too competitive? That's interesting. I would have said that the grass is probably too competitive. Um, uh, yes, it's a fight. It, it, it's like our garden. When you have kids, you want a high, high utility lawn that is very robust and it tends to be grass with other species intermingled in it. Um, it would be far better to identify an area that you could um, forego, perhaps, and either plant with a, a wildflower mix. Um, and what's even better is if you grow on the seed as sort of an interplug plants and, and plant plugs in, into the grass. Um, the grass is too uh, robust invariably and, and, and outcompetes most of the other wildflowers. There's one plant that you can plant that um, that, uh, that can help that process is yellow rattle. Yellow rattle is a parasite on grasses and will suppress grass. Um, but you need quite a bit of it. Um, and again, if you're planting the more utility grass seeds, you will struggle at the end of the day. Um, I, uh, last year, I actually uh, collected a la uh, yellow rattle seed uh, from, from along my bee walk that I do. Um, and I've just noticed they, they're all popping up. So I will let them grow on and plant them in my two meadow areas uh, in the hope that it can start to suppress some of the, the more uh, vigorous grasses. Ultimately, you're competing between grasses you want to be on fertile ground, flowers and, and, and wildflowers in particular prefer poorer soils. So, so that's your, 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 your balance really at the end of the day. Um, um, so that raises an interesting point also about how you plant your wildflower seeds. Um, it's tempting, isn't it, to think if you just throw them down onto grass that they will just sprout up, but that's not quite right. In fact, it's probably better, isn't it, just to clear the grass off. Um, I've dug a long strip alongside my vegetable plot, so I've just taken the top layer of turf off uh, and then loosened it and, and just planted the seeds there because, uh, you know, it will outcompete and it's very difficult to get them through. No. Yeah, and it's important to invariably with with wildflower seeds is is you, you scatter them on the surface of bare soil. You don't you know and don't necessarily cover it. It's just compacting you know pressing them in into the, so they've got contact. They need the the light to 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 germinate effectively. So 
so yes, you're, 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 you're trying to balance too many things perhaps, and it's, um, you know, deciding what you can, you, you, you have to have as it, you know, a high area, high utility area, and, and that which you can let, let go really. And so on just on the other scale of things, if you have got acres of space and you're wanting to create like a meadow yeah. for, um, for bumbles or generally for pollinators, would you have to start on bare soil with that? Or could it could it be spiked? I don't know how. It, it, it that is a bit of a challenge. It, it, it again, it depends on what you have to start with. If it's very, you know, tough rye grass or cooch grass or something like that, you you really want to almost take the top layer off and the, some of the soil to make it poorer, um, and then you plant your wildflowers on top. Um, the other is you know rigorous mowing, um, but in, in interspersed with with plug planting. Um, but you know it's a slow process and that's that's yeah. life and that's life unfortunately i did the back breaking job of taking the top layer of turf off i'd certainly earn my piece of cake at the end of that <laughs> <I can tell you. laughs> and also is, is this also deciding whether you want a sort of an annual uh, wildflower meadow or yes. more of a perennial one so well, i've got um on the recommendation of you lovely um bumblebee people um we've managed to source um the um seeds um from your where you get your seeds from and um it's a nice mix of both so you get the early yeah. um annuals coming through for the color and the splash and the and the speed and then you've got the perennials that will keep going um it's, it's very disappointing isn't it if you just have annuals i find yes yeah you know and you think it's, it's a bit of a waste really it's nice to have something that's just going to keep coming and there's a, there's a huge you know diversity of um seed mixes out there now depending on your soil type, depending on what type of meadow you want. Um, notice somebody in the chat has just put, um, there's also meadow mats, um, which are a good alternative to turf. Uh, but again, it's, it's if you've got high traffic on it, they, you know, it, may, it, may, not, it may not survive. So, um, so yeah, worth, worth considering really. Great. Well, that's um, we probably still, Michael. We still got some questions outstanding. Though. Well, any questions that are outstanding, as I say, we will. Don't worry, we will deal with those. And if you have any other questions, you can pop them in. Um, and uh, just checking that I need to say. What do I need to say? Um, okay. So just to remind you that we'll put all the links in the chat box now that we've talked about. So all our links, all bumblebee conservation links, the books that we've talked about links. Um, the link to get a copy of the recording and uh, any outstanding questions. And don't forget access to our, talking about seeds, our limited edition special garden bee box here with all sorts of goodies. And that includes uh, the seeds that we've just talked about, which are uh, native 100% wildflower bee friendly seeds. So that's dealing with that. Um, and um, now I don't want to let you go now, Nigel, without our big announcement. We've got <laughs> quite excited about some giant checks. So just explaining, if you don't know, if you're not a customer of ours already, um, as uh, voted for by our customers, their chosen charity for us to support is Bumblebee Conservation Trust, and hence the link for creating this talk tonight. So um, thank you so much, Nigel, for sharing all your knowledge with us. Um, but for every pound that our customers spend on our products, we pledge to donate 1p to the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. And it's coming to the end of our year to make our annual donation. So first of all, thank you so much, customers, for spending with us because it makes this possible. And um, I'm now able to give you your giant check which by magic of um, television, I shall hand over. I can announce that the amount that we've got to donate this year is £1,134.26p. 1 so I'll pass that over to you, Nigel. <laughs> oh, look at that. Look at that. I mean, work, that's hey? just slick, isn't it? <laughs> Love it. So uh, um, thanks so much for taking that. If you, it's really interesting to know what these donations can do to help your organization. So perhaps you can share with our listeners exactly what this money will go towards and how it will help. Yeah, well, thank you, Catherine, and thank you, customers. It's, you know, it's amazing to, that so many people out there are, are you know, supporting the trust and the work that we do. Um, in, in terms of how the money is spent, I, I can give you the really nice bit or the really boring bit, and I'm going to give you both, actually. Um, the really nice bit is that money like this goes towards supporting uh, projects across the country. 
So we're able to use this money to match against other funding that we raise to deliver projects like Skills for Bees or Bee Walk or uh, the project that we're developing in Scotland for the Great Yellow Bumblebee. So that's the, the really good bit of on the ground stuff doing work. The not so nice, boring bit is about behind the scenes. There's a lot of costs to keep the organisation going. So some of it will go towards supporting staff, supporting the infrastructure of the organisation, which is which is fundamental to all organisations, not just us. Um, but it also the other thing we also are, are finding is that where we are able to generate maybe surpluses during the year at the end of the year, we're able to put that into we have a in our in our policy a a a project reserve pot. Um, so we have little jam jars, what we call them, of where we can put additional money that we can ring fence so that we've got money there for new projects coming on stream. So when we're looking to develop something, new funders often want us to put our own money in, which is quite right. So this sort of money can help us top up and develop new projects as we go. So um, so yeah, brilliant, absolutely fantastic, Catherine. Thank you ever so much. Well, uh, and thank your customers you, Nigel. For your I'm so so happy that you were able to join us and give up your time because I know you're extremely busy at this time of year with all the work that you're doing. So thanks so much for coming along and giving us. We've already had lots of comments saying thanks so much. Um, people have really enjoyed the talk and they've learned so much. So we can't thank you enough for sharing your tips with us tonight.